time to start. Um, great, so thank you everyone for being here. In our last panel discussion, we learned about challenges in ensuring e equitable access to water. In our next panel on health and wash, which is water, sanitation, and hygiene, we will discuss the lack of access to improved sanitation and water throughout the world. According to UNICEF, 663 million people don't have clean water and 2.4 billion lack adequate sanitation. These basic services provide improvements in health, equity, access to education, and other things. The current COVID-19 pandemic only exacerbates these current discrepancies. This panel will investigate the role of WASH systems in community health and the historical obstacles to improving access. Moderating our panel today is Dr. Helen Amaguni, Associate Professor in the Department of Infectious Disease and Global Health at Tufts University. Also, uh, we encourage the use of the question and answer function throughout the panel, so please feel free to post your questions and Helen will moderate that for us. Thanks. I'll pass uh -huh. over to you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much and welcome to this panel on health and water, sanitation and hygiene. And thank you for the opportunity to moderate this panel. My name is Helen Amuguni and I am an associate professor in the Department of Infectious Disease and Global Health at Tufts University the coming School of Veterinary Medicine. I work at the cutting edge of the One Health paradigm, where human health, animal health, and environmental health interface and are linked, and different disciplines collaborate to solve complex health issues that, that we are facing. And so as we navigate these challenging times with a virus that is infecting more people and taking even more lives, we recognize the close and direct link between water, health, equity, and sustainable development. You can notice that the coronavirus continues to highlight the inequities in health and to further expose the most vulnerable. In many parts of the world, basic instructions that can prevent the spread of the virus, such as washing hands, are hampered by access to clean water. As we all know that one fundamental cost of health inequity is that resources are differentially distributed across lines of race, gender, class, sexual orientation, gender expression, and other dimensions of individual and group identity. And mm -hmm. there is an equal allocation of power and resources, which manifests unequal social, economic, and environmental conditions. For many with adequate sanitation, the COVID-19 pandemic has actually prompted a greater awareness of access to adequate sanitation. This afternoon, our esteemed panelists will discuss the role of WASH systems in community health, with an emphasis on identifying the obstacles to equitable access and solutions for the future. Uh, please allow me to introduce our fourth panelist today. Uh, Dr. Patrick Morelli is the CEO, International Rescue Committee, and is a strong champion and record, recognized global advocate for a systems approach to the water, sanitation, and hygiene crisis. He is an authority on sustainability local water governance and applying systems thinking to the wicked problems of providing safe water and safely manage sanitation to people. He provides high level strategic advice and support to a broad range of governments, the private sector, organizations and networks. Currently, Patrick is the chair of the steering committee of water and sanitation's global partnership, sanitation and, and water for all. Welcome Patrick. Thank you. Um, Dr. Caroline Dillea is the Deputy Director for Technology and Innovation at the Acquire Institute, a nonprofit research and consulting organization committed to increasing safe, equitable, and sustainable access to water and sanitation globally. Caroline's work focuses on analyzing policies and approaches for water safety, management, and sanitation, with projects currently ongoing in Kenya, Ghana, and Uganda. Her work also includes application of data sciences to water and sanitation, as well as technology evaluation. Welcome, Caroline. Thank you. Um, Daniel Oporto is the Regional Director for Latin America, Water for People, covering Bolivia, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Peru. Daniel is an international development expert with over 20 years of experience designing, executing, monitoring, and evaluating projects related to reducing poverty and private sector development. Daniel's experience at both consulting firms and NGOs, nonprofits, has focused on market based mechanisms in water and sanitation, sustainable and climate smart agriculture, public private partnerships, 
linking smallholders and farmers to markets, value chain and market systems development. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you so much. Glad to meet you. Yes. And finally, Dr. Daniel Lantane is an associate professor in civil and environmental engineering at Tufts University. She is a public health engineer with more than 20 years experience providing technical assistance and conducting research in more than 50 countries in Africa, Asia, and Central and South America in both development, development and emergency context. Her main research interest is how to reduce the burden of infectious diseases by investigating and evaluating the effectiveness of water and sanitation interventions. I do know that currently Dr. Lantane is also working doing some research related to wastewater surveillance and COVID-19. Welcome, Danielle. And now I'll take, I'll give our panelists a minute or two to share some opening statements. And we will go with Patrick first. Great, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Helen. And uh, hello, everybody. Pleasure to be here. And I should just, uh, I should. Would clarify just to start with, I'm not the CEO of the International Rescue Committee. It's confusing, but we do share an acronym. I'm the CEO of uh, IRC, IRC Wash, which is a Dutch based water sanitation and hygiene uh, specialist. Well, we call ourselves a think and do tank. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think we're, we've all seen once again in the face of the pandemic, in the work that we're all involved in, and certainly that IRC is involved in, uh, in Africa, in Latin America, and India, the, the critical role that access to water and sanitation play. And I think we've seen, uh, we've seen how important the resilience of the systems that we all in, engage in building are. And I think we, Early, early in the pandemic, maybe had our hopes raised that uh, water and sanitation and particularly hygiene were, were center stage in a way they hadn't been for years. And yet what we're now seeing as we progress through the pandemic, uh, as governments seek to find, uh, tackle with it and uh, come up with initial, uh, initial reactions is a tendency to sometimes to undermine years of work on making the systems more resilient by, for example, offering free water to everybody without necessarily identifying how that's going to be paid for. So you know, our work is all about strengthening water sanitation and hygiene systems to make them resilient so that this mm -hmm. fundamental, uh, this fundamental foundation of public health is there to help when we're faced by this pandemic or any other. Uh, I'll stop there for now, but looking forward to the discussion. Um, thank you, uh, Patrick, for that brief intro. Um, Caroline? Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, to briefly introduce myself, um, I am an applied researcher with the Aquaya Institute. Um, many of you probably don't know the Aquaya Institute. We're a small, uh, independent research organization, and we focus on water and sanitation, or WASH. And the research we do really sits at the intersection of many disciplines, which really is what the WASH field is. It is the intersection of engineering, social sciences, economics, public health, public policy. And that's uh, what I personally find fascinating about this field. Um, Aquaya has many research projects um, on, on water access, sanitation markets, uh, data science, but the one I want to emphasize today is that we have been uh, advising the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, regarding the impacts of COVID on the WASH sector. And so I, I really look forward to sharing some of the insights of that work with you today. Thank you, Caroline. We'll go to Danielle. Me first and then Daniel, or other way, okay. Um, yeah, it's either way. Um, my name is Daniel Antain, as, and thank you for the introduction. Um, what I would say is over about the past 10-ish years, my work has mainly focused on water sanitation and hygiene in response to outbreaks. And I think what we've seen over the past 10 years and, and what was introduced at the beginning is, is 
outbreaks are increasing, um, humanitarian response in, is increasing, and in each of these outbreaks, there's a different role for water sanitation and hygiene. So as cholera has increased, cholera has, there's quite a bit of wash work around cholera in terms of water supply and sanitation access to prevent the introduction and spread of cholera. I think with some of the other um, disease outbreaks we've seen with, with Zika, there's, there's less kind of link to wash, um, more in the vector control with mosquitoes. With, um, with Ebola, with wash, we're really looking at the hygiene around the healthcare facility. Right, and how do you keep healthcare providers safe? And there's a link around the hygiene there. And so I think as these outbreaks come up, we're all working as, as Patrick talked about to understand the role of WASH. And within COVID, the role of WASH is really around the hygiene, the promotion of the hand washing, the, the hygiene um, less so now, because I think we've rolled out that surface disinfection is a main, trans surface transmission is a main transmission route, but still surface disinfection, particularly in the healthcare facilities, but less, um, but less across the entire world. So I think um, when I think about WASH and outbreaks, I think there's always a period of understanding where WASH fits and then working within that framework to help to use WASH to help break transmission routes or ideally establish WASH like water sanitation, uh, water supply and sanitation resources to actually prevent the, the introduction of disease as we can do with cholera. And so I think that's, thank you. And that's probably the perspective I bring to this panel. Thank you. Um, thank you, Danielle. And Daniel? Sure, thank you. Well, um, Water for People is a US-based organization working uh, in nine countries in the world, including five countries in Latin America, three in Africa, and one in, in India. Um, we think and we envision a world where uh, everybody has access to water and sanitation on a sustainable uh, basis. And we work as we call the systemic approach for the SDG number six. Uh, I, uh, I would like to think about, uh, if you think about any region, even Latin America as uh, four inner rings, mm -hmm. we only work in the uh, concentrated and dispersed rural areas. We don't work in the pre-urban or urban areas. Our focus is to uh, provide uh, wider access and a great level of service uh, on a continuous that basis that lasts forever. And our flagship program is called Everyone Forever. And we, in our entry point, it's a municipality district level in every country that we work. Okay, so we create um, multi-year partnerships with the government, with local governments, uh, designing and executing uh, specific milestones to achieve what we call the everyone part that including the infrastructure works uh, at community level, at household level and public institutions level. It means providing water access and level of service for schools, um, clinics, uh, hospitals, health centers, and, um, and of course the last, the last mile that includes households, okay? Um, I, I just want to remark a great partnership that we have with IRC and Patrick working globally and creating a, a complementary work, providing uh, this type of uh, systemic approach in, in Africa and Latin America with IRC, we work at uh, a very, very articulated strategy in Honduras uh, because the challenges are not necessary in the local level. Also in the national level, the sector, the WASH sector, and as you know, one of the main bottlenecks in the WASH sector globally, and also is not different in Latin America, is untapping WASH finance mechanisms for the districts. Okay, that's, that's the whole. And we are identifying, we're constantly working, innovating different ways, bottom up, top down, to make all this needed investment lasting forever. And we define a specific time frame with the mayors, with the council, so they know that water for people will live at some specific point, and that's irreversible. And we know that we dedicate most of the efforts uh, jointly 
to achieve, as we call the everyone forever milestones. That's a general introduction at this time. I'm honored and it's a pleasure to be part of this panel. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you to our panelists. As you can see, we have a great group of panelists ranging from policy to implementation, to working at community level, to building networks and partnerships with government, to research. And so uh, the next 30 minutes or so, we're gonna focus on some specific questions to the panelists, and then we'll take some questions from the group as well. I will start with a question for you, Caroline. Um, um, how do WASH systems play a role in responding to disease outbreaks and future pandemics? And maybe to follow up on that, what are some of the markers of resiliency or warning signs of inadequacy in a system with respect to disease outbreaks? Yeah, thanks, Helen, for your question. So answering that question uh, required that I uh, try to think about what made the existing wash systems that I'm familiar with in, in Africa particularly vulnerable to this crisis. Um, so, and, and I also want to preface the, the context where, that I'm familiar with, which is uh, Africa. COVID has been as much an economic or much more of an economic crisis than a public health crisis, at least as of today. And so you should understand all my remarks as how has the WASH system reacted or coped with the economic backlash more so than the public health problem. So there's two things that made water uh, systems particularly vulnerable. The first one is that you often have a very fractured uh, landscape of water suppliers. You have generally a big public utility serving, I don't know, 20, 30% of the population. And that one is big. It's too big to fail. So it will receive a lot of attention from donors, international uh, development partners and uh, the government. And usually that's where all the support went in. Um, so for example, uh, the government, many governments in Africa and, and uh, especially the government of Ghana decided to make uh, water free for all for a period of what's now been seven months. And uh, to support that, there has been a lot of funds transferred onto, for example, the big water utility because it's well known and easy to, uh, to address. The problem is the rest of the country, served by small, fractured, not so formal water suppliers, often not registered with government authorities and so very hard to support. So those systems are also offering water for free, but have a very, very vulnerable mechanism for recovering that money. And as we speak today, most of the water systems have not recovered that money. There is no way for international donors or even central government to quickly channel support, financial support to them because they're so un un informal. Uh, so that's the, the first element is a fractured and not so formalized, not so, uh, um, yeah, not so formalized water system. And, and the second thing is that the, the second element of vulnerability is the poor financial health or, of many water uh, systems in Africa, particularly the small ones. And this means that they had no safety net. They have no cushion. When a pandemic and a crisis happens like that and uh, the government decides to make water free, um, they have no savings to go on. And so what unfortunately we're starting to see is that many of these water systems are starting to break down or, or uh, with no money for repairs because there is currently no income. So um, to answer your question, two things make wash systems particularly vulnerable, the poor financial health, which gives them no um, opportunity to bounce back. And secondly, the fact that many of them are un unregistered or, or uh, not poorly connected to central authorities. So there is very little way to support them uh, when a crisis arises. You're, I think you're on mute, Helen. Let me unmute that. Now, thank you very much, Caroline. I think this next question then would follow very closely to that. And this is to Daniel. If financial resources are the main obstacle, as Caroline has said, how can we, how can equitable water access be made into a profitable issue? 
And I think after Daniel, I, I would allow Caroline, if you have a comment on that, or Patrick or Daniel, anyone who might want to add to that, uh, be able to add. But Daniel, can you? Sure. To, please? Yeah. Sure. I mean, um, as, as mentioned before, one of the main bottlenecks globally in Latin America and developing countries about uh, bringing sustainable wash and level of service is wash finance. And we are dedicating um, many, many efforts, as I said, bottom up, top down efforts to, to work first uh, at the national policy, working with the uh, corresponding, uh, most of the countries don't have WASH, let's say ministries. Uh, we only have, in the, in the case of our five countries in Latin America, we have the case of Bolivia, where we have the water and environmental ministry. And the other far countries, we have mostly the case of housing ministry in charge of the basic services, okay? So in developing, developing countries, there are many needs, you know, and competing for the packets of the national government, it's a pretty, pretty intensive activity from local uh, local municipalities and local governments, okay? What's been, what's proven when, when foundation of our work in, in Latin America? It's supporting those local offices, local wash offices, strengthening systems, strengthening uh, institutional capacities to create a local wash offices, a local wash office. That's, that's a fundamental step that we work with the municipalities, mayors, and the, and the council itself. It's because we need, we need the, um, the, the local district First, creating whether they call a wash office, a local wash office unit, whatever. But at least we need a couple of technical staff understanding all the components of, uh, of the wash challenges. And, and please take into account that I'm talking about rural areas. In case of the Guatemala and Bolivia, can you imagine doing that in districts with people living above 3,600 3, meters of the sea level? very dry areas, very poor areas. And we are working to have at least a couple of technical staff understanding water access, sanitation, and hygiene. And that's been one fundamental action. And not always we are getting or collecting the support from the national government for this, for this effort. At least we are convincing mayors that WASH infrastructure investment has uh, as political, a social and economic and environmental return. Uh, and we have to be creative, uh, addressing very directly, and it's the very straightforward way that WASH investment have political returns as well. If we are only coming from a technical, I would say geek side saying, you know, diarrhea, you know, health, you know, we will know. Uh, get much support. We need to understand mayors and our political animals, and they need to understand where are the political returns at the same time. The second thing that I want to mention is strengthening and making all these technicians, including the mayor, how to request money to the different levels of the government within the country. Their own budget, regional government budgets and the national budgets. And we are, and we look all of them. Of course, there's the international aid cooperation budgets, but we are not very much happy with those resources, although are very much needed because in the long term, we want to get uh, a long-term sustainability and support. Sometimes I mentioned in a funny way, we are working a systemic approach, a systemic mindset. The Santa Clauses of development are not very much welcome in the wash sector because giving away water system toilets are evidence that are not sustainable solutions in the long term. So summarizing, building wash institutional units at the local level, even in rural dispersed areas and teaching them how to collect, build, the budget that is needed to build sustainable and lasting systems forever. That's, that's our flagship name. Thanks. 
Thank you, Daniel. I think that's really, really important that building from the local level upwards uh, creates resilience and sustainability and actually trying to work with those governments at that level to own the whole project. I think that's the most important. Maybe Patrick, this is a question for you. So given the honest decades of efforts in this sphere, what are the main obstacles that prevent equitable access to water and sanitation? You're muted, Patrick. I know, you'd think after seven months of practically living <laughs> on Zoom, you'd remember to switch uh, mute off, but I never do. So. Yeah. <laughs> Look, um, great question. And I'm gonna, I think, you know, build on, on what's been said before. So there's lots of, there's lots of obstacles. And particularly, you know, I'm a civil engineer by background, probably, Lots of us have technical backgrounds and there's, there's a temptation to dive straight into the technical, right? There's not enough monitoring there, so we don't, there's, and supply chains are poor. But actually, I don't, that's not the reason. The reason is that people don't care enough about water and sanitation. And particularly, you know what Danielle was just saying, politicians don't care enough about, what water, about water and sanitation. And the people who don't have access to water and sanitation, aren't important enough and their voices aren't strong enough to make people care about their having access to water and sanitation. And, you know, it's interesting because in the, in the leading, you were quoting UNICEF about the um, 600 million people unserved. But remember, I mean, that's, that's unserved with what they call either safely managed or basic. If you actually look, include the people who only have basic, which is basically not a safe supply and isn't a supply that's going to do much to impact on pandemic prevention or spread of cholera or anything else, you're talking more like 2 billion. So you're talking 2 billion people. And as Danielle was just saying, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, massively, uh, massively skewed towards those people who live in rural areas or in, in peri-urban informal areas. So again, sy systemic inequality, which has behind it the fact that we in the water and sanitation sector aren't doing a good enough job of making politicians local politicians, that's who we also, you know, we work with local politicians at the district level, same as Water for People, as you know, we work a lot together, we work in the same model, so it's all about building local district ownership, but also at national level. And you know, it's about, it's about making presidents care. It's about trying to uh, do what India did, has done with the Swatch Barrett mission, getting the president to say, it's not acceptable to have open defecation because you know, that goes to the question you asked to Daniel. Daniel, why isn't there enough finance coming into the sector? Because the government doesn't care enough. And you know, I think a final thing to say on this, and, and you know, Daniel was also you know, pointing out a lot in his intervention, it's accepting that water sanitation and hygiene are a public health intervention and they are a public service. So yes, we want them to be cost covering. Yes, it's important to focus on making them pay for each other themselves as much as possible. Yes, it's, there's a role for the private sector to play in there, but the reality is that you know, the, the only people who can break through that wall of systemic exclusion is government. No one else has the power, no one else has the mandate. We can't do it as NGOs, we can't do it as researchers, we certainly can't do it as international actors. We've got to do it as, as local embedded actors, which is, you know, I mean, I'm here talking as the global CEO of IRC, but I mean, I'm, it's certainly not in Ghana or Burkina or Ethiopia. It's not going to be me and it's not going to be and some expat member of staff who's doing this. You know, we are fully locally staffed uh, and led by passionate and networked individuals who have the ability to speak truth to power and to bring the evidence of what we're learning and doing at the district level to the top ministerial level and to preferably to the president and to begin to get people to care. 
Um, thank you, Patrick. I think one of the things that we've talked about for many, many years is the systemic inequity. And we continue to discuss that with the fact that the people at the bottom, they are the ones most affected. They're the ones who lack water. They're the ones who lack sanitation. If it's, and you are right, it's a public service, the public good. And the expectation that many people maybe in a village, community village in Rwanda will be able to afford to pay for water is might be really, really difficult. I know that Daniel has, works on this a lot to ensure sustainability. And we've seen many community-based water projects that actually are able to, to charge for it and benefit. I wanna extend this to Danielle. And um, Danielle, a little bit, if when you're thinking about, about that, for example, maybe what are the most strategic may, methods of communication, disseminating information that can allow community people, professionals in different fields, experts, to sort of make this decision and work together to improve water resources at the community level. I will say this is definitely outside my box because I don't work on this. Um, yeah. So maybe I hand. What I can say is in terms of behavior change, uh, because I, we talk a lot about behavior change and health messaging and health promotion to both communities in the development context in the learn, long term, but also certainly in the, in the COVID-19 and outbreak crises, we talk about rapid behavior change. And I will echo what other people said, and, and that never comes from external actors. The most successful um, messaging comes from local actors. Um, some of the most successful me messaging I've seen is local soccer or, or football um, stars or local nurses or local um, religious leaders. Um, whoever is the trusted, everyone has trusted people they listen to. Like you think about who do you listen to about changing your behavior? Is it Dr. Fauci or is it somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. And you think about who is, your, is that, do you trust the, the science, do you trust your mother, do you trust your, if you're a teenager, do you trust your friends? And I think in some places, some of the most impactful kind of messaging work I've been able to do is, um, for example, we helped review the Kenya nurses curriculum for water and sanitation. And so we did a small technical review and we made some very minor changes to just make sure the technical was correct. But this comes back to what Patrick is saying is the technical is, is a very small part of the problem. And then every nurse in Kenya is trained on this curriculum and then the nurses talk to their patients. So what I would say is, especially from sitting kind of in an international summit at MIT, behavior change comes from the ground and it comes from your trusted networks and rapid behavior change is very difficult because information management in an outbreak, you're, you're, I mean, the US is struggling with, with this right now, but it happens all over. Rumors, rumors, lies, misinformation, all of this comes true. Is the outbreak from a disease organism? Is it from a, a, a kind of curse? Is it, come, I mean, we're seeing that now with in the US, but it, it plays out the same in all cultures. So maybe that's, yeah. Thank you, Danielle. I think that was, even though you said it's out of your box, but I think you have such good ideas and uh, in intuitions into that. I will move you into your box a little bit. Uh, back to Danielle. There's been a lot of attention paid to wastewater as a potential vector for the novel coronavirus. In response to disease outbreaks, what is generally the bigger issue? For example, is it isolation of feces or access to clean drinking water? And are these separate issues? And this comes back to what I was saying at the beginning, which is what is the role of the wash space in each disease outbreak? In cholera, it's isolation of feces. You have to isolate that feces from getting in the environment, from getting on the food, from getting into water. In, in COVID and Ebola, actually, there's very little data showing that these viruses can survive in feces, and there's, there's almost no indication that they can be transmissible in feces. However, WASH plays a different role here, which is each person excretes a small amount of those viruses in their feces. And if you're in a system where you have a large sewage system, enough people excrete, who are positive excreting a tiny amount can be measured, right? And actually people tend to excrete before they show symptoms and before they become symptomatic. And it's a small amount, but when you put, an right now there's in the Boston area, there's 4 million people 
that feed into the um, Deer Island Wastewater Treatment Plant, right? A small amount and a lot of people, you can use that as an indicator, a surveillance indicator. And if you're interested, I can put in the, um, I can put in the chat here a link to the indicator to the data that's come out of MIT, which is showing surveillance of wastewater as an indicator of uptick in cases. And this work, um, I'm not directly involved. My lab is not directly involved, but I'm working with people who are. And there's a network of researchers across the globe who are doing this in each individual city um, and measuring techniques for this. And it's becoming a surveillance indicator. And it's actually very powerful. And right now, if you see the Boston data, it's quite scary because it's going up and it, it presaged the rise in Boston that we saw in the cases in the last week or so. And so I would say to me, it's never, I'm, I, I, it's never about water or sanitation or hygiene. It's about what is the appropriate thing. In COVID, it's wastewater surveillance and washing your hands. Right, that's what we need to do here. And I would say, some people ask me, is water more important or sanitation or hygiene? It all depends. If you're in a rural area in the desert and you have two liters per person per day, water supply is the most important thing, right? You've got to get enough water. So to me, it's got to be context driven. But that's that's kind of what I would say to the question of which is more important is it depends on where you are. Okay, thank you, Danielle. That's, a, that's, that's great to think about. Uh, one of the things I think that's been obvious is the way this, the wastewater surveillance is actually being used as an early warning system. So in an area, the moment they do it, then you can be able to foretell what's going to happen within a few weeks, in a few weeks time. Caroline, I think you've been quiet. I'm gonna come back to you with a question. So given the recent public attention placed on hygiene, has the approach to sanitation changed uh, specifically with, go with governments, communities, institutions? Are they shifting strategies? Or is there a need to shift strategy? Thanks, thanks for your question. And I should say if by sanitation, you mean the access to toilets or, or waste uh, management. I, I haven't witnessed uh, huge changes in that in, in Africa yet. But where I have, we've seen, um, uh, responses is in the water uh, and hygiene sector. So um, I can talk about a short term response that governments have had and uh, a kind of a longer term response that they're starting to craft. So the first one is there's been a lot of efforts by governments to make water more easily available to the to, to the greater number of people. And that has been through tariff reductions or actually making water free in, in many cases. So the, the countries that we have studied at Aquaya are uh, Kenya, uh, DRC, Senegal, all of these um, have mandated that water from public water utilities are free for several months, initially only for the poorest fraction of the population, but in practice, almost everyone. Uh, Ghana has been even more aggressive uh, and has made water free for all at any water system across the country. And, and that's, it's been seven months to, to date. Um, so these, th this was like a, a big move towards making water more available so that people could uh, better wash their hands, basically, and, and also suffer less from the economic crisis that uh, was about to come. Um, I, I've, I've mentioned before, this was a, w a very well-intentioned decision, but it, it can and it will backfire because this means that there is no revenue for water uh, service providers and, and this will certainly backfire. Um, the longer term response that we're starting to see is that there is now greater uh, attention paid to the needs of vulnerable and marginalized populations. So th there's always been this problem of exclusion that, that Patrick was mentioning that the very poor have the least access, uh, but COVID has managed to put a lot of attention on that and, and governments, development partners, donors, uh, are now um, putting a lot of emphasis on how do we improve inclusion? How do we make sure that the poorest of the poor, the most vulnerable, do have access as well to water services in the future? And so there is now talks about how to target subsidies at them. How do we make water services more affordable to them? 
if not to the general public. And this is a topic that we've seen emerge in the past five months and as, as a, a result of, of COVID, in my opinion. Thank you. I'll probably build on that and just ask uh, maybe all of you to comment, starting with Patrick. Uh, besides what Caroline has talked about and some of the things that you've mentioned on the impact, on the financial economic impact of COVID, what are some of the other impacts of this pandemic on the ground in the wash world? And maybe we'll start with Patrick and then Daniel. Patrick, you're mute. You're muted, Patrick. <laughs> Never learn. <laughs> I think I think we've touched on several of them. I think that there's been the whole issue around uh, around governments, yeah, particularly when in the early days when they were trying to encourage people to stay at home uh, and uh, implementing one sort of lockdown or another as part of the sort of social easing measures around that making water free. And that's kicked off a whole discussion. I mean, uh, as Caroline was, I think, referring to whole discussion among you know, the World Bank and, and various others about what's the impact of that on the utilities. Then, of course, there's the whole other discussion. Well, that's great. You're making it free for the people who are already better off because they're benefiting from those utility provided services. But what are you doing for the poorest of the poor? And I think governments have done their best to respond to that. It's also had a negative impact because a whole load of projects have just stopped. I mean, certainly our teams uh, I think Water for People's teams were all severely restricted in, at least in the early months of the of the pandemic from going to the field at all. So actually quite a lot of people suffered from reduced services. I think bigger picture, and what I'm still hopeful about, is that by reinforcing for governments the, the critical link of yeah, of water sanitation and hygiene as critical elements of public health infrastructure, and particularly the focus on hygiene. I mean, Daniela, you know, completely right. It's all, you know, every outbreak, the role of washing it is different. But in fact, from a broad public health perspective, decent access to reliable water and sanitation and hygiene services are a fundamental public health intervention. And look, I don't know if this is wishful thinking, but certainly it's what we're, what, as an organization, we're, dedicate, we're, we're dedicating ourselves to trying to make this a good crisis for WASH, to trying to grab onto that attention that, that the pandemic has brought to the importance of hygiene, but also the importance of access to clean water to do hygiene, also importance to the, the importance of access to uh, to safe latrines that people are prepared to use so that when you're trying to isolate people, they're not all crowding into one latrine that they're sharing with 20 other families or crowding 300 people to one hand pump that they're sharing with 300 other people because you're trying to get them to socially isolate, right? So we're trying to use the opportunity that's provided by COVID to raise the profile of the sector as a whole and to, yeah, to get the political the national political leadership that's essential to get more investment into the sector and to basically uh, strengthen the systems and make them more resilient for the next pandemic, whatever form it takes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Maybe Daniel, I will just add uh, a quick caveat to what were to the question. If you think about it in terms of race, and gender relations. Um, the current pandemic has amplified the roles of this. And how does this apply in relation to WASH? Uh, Helen, that's a great question. That's a great question. And uh, I, want, I would like to answer from this perspective. I am a Bolivian based in La Paz, Bolivia, working with five countries in Latin America. I want to say that COVID and the pandemics is uh, making uh, the gender working, uh, the inequality uh, broader, the gap is making, is, is becoming larger. Why? Because the invisibility 
of the problems in the rural areas working in the communities where extreme poverty and poverty populations live. Uh, because of different interest in the media pandemic, it seems to be only a problem for the urban people, only for the restaurants, the airports, people cannot travel, people cannot get access to supermarkets. And that's very, very disappointing. Uh, we, as what for people, we have tried to bring the voice of uh, indigenous communities uh, facing many challenges in weather access, uh, um, monitoring water, water quality in rural areas. We are supporting uh, different districts with chloride uh, during the pandemics. But the most important thing is that I see very sadly that different interests are just making very difficult for the for the minorities uh, to speak up about the, um, how the COVID is affecting their lives on a daily basis. I, in one event, I tried to say to speak up about this in an international event here in Latin America. And some people from the same panel told me that, yeah, but Daniel, you know, the low income people living in rural areas, they live in scattered regions. They don't, they don't even meet. They live um, one kilometer distance among each other and, I, and that's a belief. And I said, you are, you are absolutely wrong because the people in the rural areas, in the villages, they meet at schools, they make decisions. There are different ways of governance within a community. Most of the time they meet at, at the schools. Most of the time they meet where the market, the rural market works. They are trading food, they are bartering food, they are selling, they are buying. So they are in touch. They're, it doesn't exist like a, because they are poor or they are living in rural areas, they are maintaining the distance. No, that's not right. And if you if you check, I've been I've been collecting data from major newspapers in the five countries that I live. Uh, I just wanted to give uh, some quantitative information about how the, the, the context of rural areas and COVID and wash, uh, hand washing is it's important in rural areas because there are many flyers, information saying you need to wash your hand, you need to keep your distance. Do you know what does it mean to have a soap or wash your hand in rural areas? Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist. Yeah. So, um, answering and going to your point, COVID is making the lives of, um, of uh, indigenous communities uh, and different um, people in low, from the low income communities very much difficult. And they, it's not been possible to, to speak up about them as usual. Okay. Danielle, I will swing you another curveball. Uh, because we talk about wash, but I, I think you've noticed that a lot of the time we're talking about people. Let's take a step and think about animals because people depend on animals mostly for their livelihood. And right now those water resources are shared. And let's think about the environmental aspect of it. So bringing all this in together, the human, the animal, the environmental aspect. What do you think are some of the things we should be thinking about so that we have a holistic approach to responding to wash or in these times of COVID-19? I think when sometimes it can be very simplified to only think about, okay, we have a cholera outbreak, we'd like to stop cholera, right? But at the same time, we have to remember that underneath it, there's, a, and this comes from the One Health perspective, as you know, um, the whole piece of wash and environment and environmental health and exposure to animals and nutrition comes together in terms of how a child develops. So when we talk about um, diarrhea in a child being the third largest cause of death in children under five worldwide, it's not that a child happens to get diarrhea one day and happens to pass away from that, it's that the child is living in an environment where they're exposed to the feces of animals and humans. They have a different gut microbiome. They might be malnourished. They might um, 
they might not be able to become nourished depending on their gut microbiome. Can, it, can additional food actually help or not? Um, and that whole environmental animal health is impacting their development and it impacts how susceptible they are to the disease and if they can recover and if they recover or are they gonna have more impact? Because we've also seen children with moderate to severe diarrhea are more likely to have more malnutrition and death nine to 12 months after having moderate to severe diarrhea. And so this is where we need to look, like right now I'm very focused in my research on the humanitarian response side of things, which in some ways is much simplified. We'd like to stop cholera, we'd like to stop Ebola, right? That, that, but actually if we're talking about having every child be able to grow up healthy, that means water, sanitation, nutrition, environmental health, we know, it, it, taking care of the animals so that there's less animal human interaction in terms of the feces, that's a much larger environmental health perspective. And I think is much more difficult to encompass such that the donors will fund it. And I know that Tufts in particular is working on a number of these projects, looking at, um, and I'm involved from the WASH side, the linkages between malnutrition WASH, environmental health and animals. And I think that is, and a super important direction to go for child health long-term. Thank you, Danielle. Um, I'm gonna go to the Q&A section because we have a number of questions out there. Um, I think the first question is for you, Daniel. And I think the other panelists can also uh, make comments on that. What in your opinion should be the ideal interaction and relationship between NGOs and government in working towards WASH goals? Sure. I mean, uh, as I said before, I mean, we need, we, we always tend to think that the government is only the national government. Okay. In the case of WASH, that's not necessarily the, the reality. We have at least, according to different contexts, three levels the national, regional, and local government. Okay. Um, as I said, nonprofits uh, role working with the government, first with the local governments at the local level, at district level, is um, working the basics about strengthening uh, institutional presence, institutional technical presence about addressing wash, uh, the wash needs, not only the wash need, also integrated resource water management, which is, which is another, another approach that we need another conference to discuss about. But um, integrator water resource management, it's also uh, another way that nonprofits can work with the governments because it's linked to, to, the, to, the, um, to the climate change uh, challenges that uh, small communities, indigenous communities, uh, scattered communities are facing in the rural area. That's one thing. The second, the second role of nonprofits, it's making uh, wash finance available from regional governments when their competencies within the public finance uh, led the regional governments to attend uh, WASH needs. And the third level, of course, is as Patrick mentioned, and he insisted, and I agree with him, is that national policy, national policy. Just give an example. What's our Water for People's role right now across the five countries that we're working is supporting the creation of a system with local WASH offices across the country. Okay, it's easier to say that than making it uh, possible. I mean, we're working more than five years and we have not achieved that the milestone yet in any of the five countries. Why? Because uh, working with the national government, working in the environment on different political cycles within the Latin America and the developing countries is always a challenge. One of the countries that we are Almost there is, I would say, um, Bolivia. We already have uh, 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 local wash offices. Uh, it's under one specific uh, decree from the Water and Environmental Ministry, but the local, uh, the political cycles are making very difficult to to have it approved for the national level. Okay, but uh, that's the kind of things how NGOs can and should involve with the governments to identify what are the systemic bottlenecks, uh, what are the systemic um, challenges that, that countries 
country programs need to overcome, starting with WASH finance, WASH institutional strengthening at the local level, especially for the rural areas. Mm -hmm. um, um, thank you, Daniel. I think the next couple of questions, I'll probably go the first one with Caroline and see what you think, and then Patrick, the next one. Caroline, the question about policymakers. How do we make it easier for policymakers to think about systems holistically across the environment, health, nutrition, and watch? Yeah. I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough one. Um, you know, I, I think one of the, maybe the, the shortfalls of, of a lot of us in the wash sector, and that would include policymakers, is, is that they're most usually trained as engineers or, or technical people. And oftentimes, I mean, I'm an engineer as well, so I put myself in that. <laughs> um, oftentimes, this means that we haven't been trained to think about things holistically. We have been trained to think about things as a technical issue. And, um, and the problem is that mentality really sticks unless you, you actively try to fight it and have been really involved in the field to, to address the problem in, in a multidisciplinary way. So I, I, and that doesn't answer how do you make it easier, but maybe at the root is, is training uh, water and sanitation specialists who are maybe more multidisciplinary than what they currently are. Um, maybe that's that's a bit vague, but I, I would say that this is a, a bias that a lot of WASH professionals have. Okay, thank you. And Patrick, going to you, I think someone asked you to verify the quote, people don't care enough about water and sanitation, and people who care enough are not in a position that is important enough. I know that you were talking about the political decisions or at policy level, but can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. Sure, and I, I gave it a thumbs up because I'm happy to be I'm happy to be associated with that quote. And I think, you know, again, I'm a I'm a recovering civil engineer, right? <laughs> I graduated as a civil engineer. <laughs> And I've spent a lot of my professional life moving away from that. And particularly, you know, working with, working with communicators, working with influencers. And, you know, one of the things that in my own organization we're trying hardest to do, and we're a very nerdy bunch of people. And, you know, we work with a choir and we work with Water for People. We work with, you know, and we're all nerds and we love going to conferences and we love sitting on panels and we love having nerdy discussions and going down into the detail. And we'll often say things like, oh, those politicians, you know, politicians don't understand tariff setting. They're such a nuisance. You know, the system would be perfect if it wasn't for them. And I think for me, part of the learning journey has been getting out of that and not sort of thinking, and you still are trying to think, well, how can we make a policymaker decide? But talk to policymakers, understand what drives policymakers and politicians, engage with parliamentary groups on water and sanitation. And, you know, again, I mean, for me, the power, the, the biggest example we've probably seen in the last decade has been, just because of the size of it, has been the Swaj Bharat mission in India. It just means clean India. That's all it means. You know, that's the level of messaging that a, that a prime minister, that a president, that a head of state can get be up behind. And the more we complicate it by bringing in all the things that we get passionate about and the nerdy detail, the less we're answering their question about why should I care? You've got to engage on that level of I want to be the prime minister of a clean India. We can't be like this anymore. And that opens the door for us to come in with our specific technical solutions, for us to address the financial problems. So it's not that we shouldn't be doing all of that stuff, but I think it does mean that we have to communicate. We have to get much more comfortable, not just talking to each other in our comfort zones, but going to talk to people who we don't, who we're less comfortable with. Because though, you know, those are the policymakers, but I think there's a very poor understanding often within our sector of who those policymakers are. And if we want to bring 
the people for whom water is important, but who don't have strong voice and help to bring their voice to the table. We have to help to articulate that voice into a way that really matters for people who are in a position to make decisions. Thank you very much, Patrick. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all our panelists and to just say that I think in our group, we have many civil engineers. I want to say that I'm a veterinarian. And that's that's different. And so thinking about this, thinking about WASH from that holistic aspect of how do we bring in different disciplines? How do we engage policymakers? How do we engage community members? How do we think about gender, cultural issues? All these things that sort of build together uh, to solve the problem of WASH, that holistic complex problem. I think that's sort of one of the ways in which we can be able to go. Thank you so much. I'm sorry that we're not able to get to all the questions, but thank you to our panelists, Caroline, Patrick, Daniel, and Danielle. I think you did an awesome job and I am grateful. And I think the MIT team that's organizing this conference will provide more information. And thank you to Shoni for organizing this as well. Thank you. Thank oh, you very thank much. Thank you so much. Huge Thanks. thank you to all our panelists and to our moderator. Um, it was a great talk and I learned a lot. Um, so moving on with the conference, um, we're going to take a short break now before our next presentation. You can feel free to get up and move or join the Zoom break room that I've just put in the chat to continue the conversation or if you need technical assistance. Thank you. <laughs>